Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we come to this word from very different places. Uh, for those of us, there's a spectrum uh, where some of us are outside the circle of faith, but kind of curious. Uh, and we're so glad, Father, our friends are here with us exploring the who and the what of Christianity in Jesus. There are those of us who've been uh, just come to know you in the last year, and there are others who've been walking with you for decades. And we would ask, Lord, that you'd give us all open minds, soft hearts, and that you would woo us to yourself through the power of your spirit in your word, that we will know the absolute passion you have for us to not only know that we are saved, to not only save us, but to know that we are saved in Christ Jesus. This is our prayer in his name. Amen. Now, when you think of the most successful Australian band internationally, who would you come up with? ACDC is probably it. We knocked them back on a school dance, would you believe? I wanted them, but the other two prefects said no. My goodness me. Anyway, but uh, up there's got to be in excess. Um, and uh, Michael Hutchins, who is the front man for In Excess, a man who really lived up to the name of the band, In Excess, uh, tragically sort of marked his life. In fact, I remember seeing In Excess. They were the support band for the greatest band in the world, Cold Chisel, but you don't know who they are, so I'll move on. And Michael Hutchins tragically took his life in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel way back in 1997 in Double Bay. And at his funeral, his brother said that when he was much younger, Michael Hutchins said that he, he made a list of 10 things that he wanted to achieve in his life. Number one was to conquer the world. Sort of modest goal. Now that may be the language of generals and kings and emperors and rock legends, but I wonder if you realise it's actually the language of us Christians, followers of Christ, that we are conquerors. Now you're thinking, conquerors? Man, I can't get a girlfriend to go out, a girl to go out with me or get a job. How do you expect me to think of myself as a conqueror? Well, let the, let the text shape how you think. In Romans 8.37, and remember this is the last of a long, if you're new to us uh, this uh, today, the first time you've joined us, we're at the end of a study. We've just been enjoying Romans 8. If the book of Romans is the Himalayas, then Romans 8 is Mount Everest. And the end of Romans 8 We've landed on the top. We're looking. It is a magnificent view, and I hope you come and enjoy it. But in Romans 8.37, we read, Know in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we saw that the chapter begins on this thumping note of assurance. Remember Romans 8.1? I hope, I hope you've memorized it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Magnificent. And it ends on an even stronger note in verse 39, that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Man, so where it counts, we in Christ, we conquer. And we conquer for one reason. Actually, for many reasons, but for one reason right now. And that is because God works in all things. He will have his way in everything. You know the very famous verse that David opened up for us, Dave opened up for us last week. God works in all things for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purposes. That God is the great recycler. He turns the pain and suffering of life into the fruit of the spirit to the glory of God he turns the sins of men and women into the praise of God uh, we saw and Dave had some beautiful phrases did he not he said the Bible is not promising you Disneyland Christianity or Lunar Park Christianity if I could bring it closer to home we we are not promised a force field in which suffering can't um, kind of pierce through and get us that's not what the Bible is offering. God, we're told in that verse, in, God works in all things, which means the pain and the pleasure, that there is a quota of suffering that God is entrusting to you through the course of your natural life. And he does it with one specific purpose, to shape you to be more like his son. God's got one stubborn goal. The highest good for God is, is your Christ-likeness, you reflecting the beauty of his son. In the end, what it does is it actually makes us hungry for heaven. Now, our particular little story, we've all got little stories, our each little story is located on God's big story, on a big canvas. And you, you really need to see your life against a much larger backdrop. Otherwise, you will go nuts in this world. 
And uh, the way in which Romans 8, 28, 29 do it is through the use of five words. I'm only recapitulating what, uh, recapturing what Dave talked to us last week. And those five big words really tell the big story. And, the, and it's the one history lesson you've got to get right. You may not know when the first fleet came to Australia, but this is the history lesson you've got to know. Because before it's about me, me, myself and I, my three favourite people, it's about he. He who, and this is what's called the golden chain of blessing. He who before time foreknew, predestined, then he called, justified and then glorified at the end of the age. And really what that story is, a story of God's grace. God's undeserved grace from eternity to eternity. It's the story of absolute assurance because there's no fallout. The very group he foreknew and predestined before time happens to be the very same group he glorifies. This is a love we can't earn, friends. This is a love we don't deserve. This is a love we can't lose. And really, the Apostle Paul wants to drown us in a sea of certainty so that we could grasp at the very core of our de spiritual DNA, the wonder of God's inescapable love. That's why we're more than conquerors. Hence the question in verse 31, Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to this? Well, tragically, some Christians want to say, it's unfair. What do you mean God chooses? I choose God, he doesn't choose me. Or I choose God because he chooses me. But actually what Romans is teaching us is that I got to choose God because he first chose me. And you can spend the rest of your life saying it's not fair. And look, to be fair, there's a quota of Christians who do that. Well, you can do that. There's another road you can go down. It's called the gratitude road. Because that's the road I want to go down. It's the road that says, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you. Because if you left me to myself, if you handed me over to my hard heart, that's exactly where I would be, walking independent of my saviour. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to get a chance at the end of this sermon to do that, to say thank you. Now, the rest of Romans 8 really wants to celebrate this assurance. It dares anyone to deny your place in God's plan if you're a follower of Christ. Let me say that again. The next set of five questions are going to be thrown up. And it's as though it's kind of like Paul's in a boxing match. He's going to d dare anyone who will deny your place in God's plan. Because God not only wants to save you, he wants you to know that you are saved. Like it's really important to him. So question number one, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? It's an excellent question, isn't it? It actually crops up, pops up in the Bible here, there and everywhere. If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about it. Well, nobody. No, everybody and who cares? The thing about having God on my side, the, the thing about being on the right side of God, it means that whatever comes my way, we will be victorious. We will conquer. That's what the word conquer means. That God's purposes can't be frustrated. That our victory in Christ is assured. If God is for me, then who can be against me? Well, everybody, and they're not going to win. But when doubts start to seep in, it's always time then to move to the cross to ground that assurance. Question 2, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God has done, this is what it's basically saying, if God has done the hardest thing, then it guarantees that he will do everything else he has promised. Because the hardest thing God has ever had to do for you, he's already done. That was to hand over his son. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And if God did not withhold his one and only son, if God did what he wouldn't ultimately even ask Abraham to do, if God did not withhold his one and only son, do you think now he's going to withhold all those other things he's promising you? Like your resurrected body, your forgiveness, your adoption in Christ, the new creation? Of course not. The hardest thing God has ever had to do for you, he's already done. It's behind him. The rest of it's easy peasy. But maybe you're thinking, yeah, Ray, but you don't understand. You don't know what this last week, month, year, decade has been like. I am sure I've disqualified myself. Sin's still lurking. Guilt's still condemning. Satan's still accusing. Let's go to question three then. Verse 33. 
Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Now, the book of Romans really started with a courtroom scene. God had placed every human being in the courtroom. Jew, Gentile, male, female, rich, poor, we're all there. And, um, and God has issued a verdict. He's basically told the world, shut up. There's no one righteous, not even one. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, that we're all under the power of sin. There's no us and them, it's just us, the lot of us. But the beautiful thing is God has not left us in that courtroom condemned because then we're introduced to the, the beautiful death of Jesus that, that deflected God's anger away from us and onto himself. And as a result of that, we get to walk out of that courtroom knowing that we are justified. That is, knowing that we can know now what God is going to say on the last day, and that is not guilty. And then we get to walk out of the courtroom and we go up the hill into the palace and get to share in the co-reigning rule of Christ himself. There's no condemnation. Those God chose are those God is entitled to justify, forgive. If God has personally handpicked you before time, which if you're a follower of Jesus, that's exactly what he's done, then you, then no one has the right to condemn you. Now maybe you're thinking... Yeah, but Satan, he knows stuff that no one else knows. <laughs> Satan may try to condemn you. And let's face it, his name means accuser, but it's off limits to him. Don't let Satan win a battle when he's lost the war. He's already been disarmed at the cross. That first Good Friday, he was stripped of his weapons. The moment Jesus paid the full payment for your sins, the moment he took full responsibility for your failures, it means Satan's got nothing to sort of shoot out at you. It's like he's shooting blanks. He's like those shovel-edged sharks I got to catch years ago in Southwest Rocks. They're so impressive. They're so big. But they've got no teeth. You can stick your hand in them. They're all bark and no bite. Satan can't condemn you on the last day, so don't let him condemn you now. So you, Satan may know your past. He probably tempted you to every one of those sins that you did. But you know his future. It's called the lake of fire. So Satan has no right to condemn you. Your non-Christian family and friends have no right to ultimately condemn you. I know they may say now something like, I thought you're supposed to be a Christian when you and I don't behave the way we should. And they've got a point. And they may be able to list those failures, those inconsistencies, those elements of hypocrisy. It's just that those accusations won't find their mark on the last day when Judgment Day comes. Now, let's face it, it's true. If you follow Jesus, there's not a day that goes by when you haven't sinned. There's not a day that goes by when you haven't grieved the Spirit of God. But you just need to know that you have the spirit of sonship in you. Not slavery. S slavery has to do with fear and fear has to do with punishment. Well, that's not Christianity. That's, that's religion, but it ain't Christianity. And yeah, I've got my quota of regrets. Boy, have I got my quota of regrets. And yeah, it is right to feel the impact of what your sins do on God. You do impact God. You just need to know you can't make God angry. I hope I didn't say that in an angry tone, but you got the idea. You can't make it. That was the whole purpose of the cross. That God would deflect his anger away from you and onto his dear son who willingly took it in our place. And by the way, you're not allowed to condemn yourself either. Yeah. Who do you think you are? Thinking that after God chose you, justified you, you decide to condemn yourself. How dare you condemn yourself after what God has done for you? Oh no, shame on you and shame on me when we do it. We need to give ourselves a good talking to, don't we? And you know the way you do that? Is by preaching the gospel to yourself. Every morning, look in the mirror. I know it's not pretty, but look at it. The older you get, it gets less pretty, I'm, I'll guarantee it. Take a look at this melon. And you just recite the gospel. For me, it's my favourite verse, Galatians 2.20b. The life I live in this body, I live... <laughs> this body. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right. Okay. Let's go. You do not have a right to condemn yourself after God handpicked you and then justified you on the basis of Jesus' death. Still not satisfied? 
Let's go to question 4, verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, is also interceding for us. See, who really has, who is the only person entitled to condemn you? That would be the God appointed judge of all the earth. Now, who exactly is that? Well, all judgment has been entrusted to the Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, do you think he's going to condemn you? This would be the same Jesus who, by the way, took those nails for you and me at the cross who wore our blame and carried our shame all the way to Golgotha on that first Good Friday. Do you think after doing that, he's going to turn on you? That's the same Jesus, by the way, who rose from the dead in that death-destroying resurrection and now promises you the same resurrection body as himself. Do you think after his death and resurrection, after going through all the effort of enduring all that pain and inflicting all that shame upon him, that he would at the end turn on you? This would be the same Jesus who now is seated at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for us. Because think about it. What exactly is Jesus doing at the right hand of the Father? I don't know what you think he's doing when he thinks about your life. Do you think he's dobbing you in? Slandering you? Do you think he's having a conversation with his heavenly Father and saying, Oh my goodness, she is such a pathetic Christian dad. This is Jesus speaking to the Father about you. You ladies, do you think this is the kind of conversation he's having with, about you? Oh, Heavenly Father, really, give her another week. That's all I'd give her. She still hasn't had a decent quiet time in the last year. She rarely picks up her Bible, occasionally prays. I don't know why you put up with her, Dad. And then she belly aches at the fact that she never feels my presence. What exactly is Jesus saying to the Father? Guys, what do you think he's saying about you? Oh, ditch him, Dad. Dropkick. Loser. He's, he prayed that prayer 15 years ago, and man, he's still battling with porn. Do you believe it? Give him the flick. He's hopeless. No, 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 no. Every moment of every day... The Lord Jesus stands as your advocate. He's not pleading your innocence, because there isn't any. He's not pointing out your guilt. And he's not making cheap excuses for your failures and mine. Tell you what he's doing. He's presenting his righteous, obedient life, death and resurrection to his Father. So that every moment of every day and smack bang in the middle of every sin that you commit, Jesus is functioning as your advocate. He is interceding for you. That's the key phrase. Not against you, for you. He's got your back in the middle of your failures. It's almost as if we're afraid to let this assurance wash over us. It's almost, it's almost as if it's too good to be true. I don't think I can trust Jesus dying for my sins. I'm not sure I can trust him to that extent. But that would be a shame because that's the very opposite to what this passage is wanting to do. See, what kept Christ on the cross wasn't those nails, as you know, it was his love. And what, kept Christ, what keeps Christ interceding for you at the right hand of the Father is that same love. Because the ultimate grounds of our assurance, my friends, is the, the intrinsic love of God within the Trinity. And no wedge will be allowed to separate you from that love. And what Paul does now is he kind of scoops up every possible scenario that in any way might cause you to misread the fact that God doesn't love you. So question five, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Where did we get the idea that coming to Jesus means there ain't going to be any pain as part of the story? Where did we get the stupid idea in thinking that if I love Jesus and he loves me, that there'll be no suffering on the table. That is not biblical Christianity. That's Disneyland Christianity, but it ain't biblical Christianity. And that's why I think Paul quotes Psalm 44. Because in that context, Israel is getting hammered by its enemies. And in that psalm, the psalmist says, even though we have not forgotten God, nor forsaken the covenant. 
So it's possible to have God love you, experience suffering, and not because of sin. That actually suffering can actually be handed to you under God's providence with a specific purpose in mind. That suffering was not a denial of God's unfailing love for Israel then, and it's not a denial of God's unfaithful love to you, God's faithful love to you now. That's a hard one, isn't it? Ever sit with someone who's had a miscarriage, going through a divorce, whose spouse has just left them, lost a loved one in their family? Well, we've heard story after story this series, uh, usually on video of people in our church facing cancer, losing the loss of a child. And God, in his strange wisdom, is entrusting a quota of suffering because his highest good is so that we'll be more like Jesus. And don't ever misread that, that he doesn't love us. Even though the battle is, and it does involve a quota of arm wrestling God with a bucket load of tears. But it will result in either bitterness or being better. And the decision is in our hands. You know, Michael Hutchins wanted to conquer the world. But that just won't do. Because God wants us to be more than conquerors. Verse 37. By the way, if ever you get to the bedside, de- the, the bedside of someone who's dying, this would probably be a good passage to read to them if they're a follower of Jesus. If they're not a follower of Jesus, take them to John 3.16. But this has been used by me many times as I sat next to many people who are about to breathe their last, who love Jesus. And whether they can hear me or not, I'm not always sure, but I'm saying it anyway because the hearing is the last sense to go, they say. So just note it down, back end of Romans. Next time you're with someone on their deathbed. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't think he took one breath in all that sentence. It's just he just can't help himself. He's explored every kind of scenario that will drive a wedge between you and the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that wedge does not exist. If you want to be more than conquerors, then don't let anything or anyone conquer your confidence in Christ's love. Oh, let me say it again, if I haven't said it a billion times. It is important to God that he save you through Jesus Christ. And it is just as important to God that you know you are saved. So what won't drive a wedge between you and the love of God in Christ Jesus? Neither death nor life, he says. For to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a win-win scenario. Die young, die old, either way we die in Christ. Hallelujah. I know it's grief for everybody else, but for the person who dies, fantastic. God bless them. Neither angels nor demons can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Satan's mouth is silenced. You can call out to the demons of hell. Which of you are going to accuse me and deny my place in God's purposes? And not one will be allowed to speak. Hell will freeze over before they will be allowed to issue an accusation against you. Neither the present nor the future. Encased in a world where there's so much uncertainty. And there is, isn't it? Employment, health, you just don't know what's around the next corner. But with so much uncertainty, if you're in Christ Jesus, know this, that your future holds no surprises and your present holds no ultimate fears. Nothing, no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So be convinced. That's the point. You know, Tolstoy, let's face it, who's read a Tolstoy novel? They're very big books. Anyone? I know it's a bit dark here. Has anyone? I I caught four people at 10.45 service. Anyone read a Tolstoy? Don't be ashamed. Yes, two. Who is that? Todd, is that you? Have you read two Tolstoys? Well done. Well, he's an American. That explains it. He doesn't come from Rudy Hill. I'm waiting for the the, the sort of 25-minute summary. Um, anyway, here's a picture of, uh, I'll tell you what I have read, a bit of his confessions. And um, uh, Tolstoy, if you don't know his story, he's like the great right Russian novelist, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina. I said that quickly because I don't know how to pronounce it. 
anyway, Leo Tolstoy, think about this guy. He, he, in his confessions, he talks about how he's in his study and he's, as he's working, as he's writing, he sees a rope and he can't bear to have that rope in his office for fear that he will use it to hang himself. And here is a man, it's quite kind of shocking really because he's kind of, he ticks all the boxes. He is really gifted, publicly recognised as a great writer, a beautiful loving wife, great kids, he's loaded to the gills. He's got kind of everything and yet he couldn't bear the thought of having a piece of rope in his office for fear that he would use it to kill him. Because why? Because... It was so unbearable to him because he had it all, but he never felt so alone in this alien universe. He just felt so alone. And then he talks about how he might have used it were it not for the fact that he talked about how he lost himself in the love of Christ from which nothing could separate him. He lost himself in the love of Christ from which nothing can separate him. You know, when I read that, I thought to myself, I wonder if, if only Michael Hutchins knew that, he might have ended his life in such tragic circumstances. It's sad, isn't it? You know, I've got uh, a, a print in my office. It's of this picture that I saw many, many years ago. You've seen it. It's a common picture now. It's, it's of a lighthouse that sort of springs up just off the coast of France. It's quite well known. Uh, a, a French photographer took this photo and uh, a lot similar to it, sort of the before and after of this shot. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh man, I love that, I've got to have that. Uh, I wanted it for my, I asked Sandy to get it for me for Christmas one year. And the reason why I wanted it is because I thought, man, look at it, it just, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 metre lighthouse, 10 metre waves thrashing against the lighthouse. And I thought, I oh, it kind of captures something in me that I, I want to be like that lighthouse that no matter how many things buffet me, you know, suffer, suffering and pressure and all that, I want to stand strong. I want to stand true for Jesus. But that's not the reason why I wanted it. The reason why I wanted it is if you look closely, there's, there's a man in the, um, in the doorway. And then I thought to myself, yeah, that's right. I'm not the lighthouse. God's purposes, his love, that's the lighthouse. I'm the guy in the doorway, protected by the lighthouse against the big waves. That's better. And I thought, but that's not the reason why I wanted it. The reason why I wanted it is if you look very closely at him, you see where his hands are? He's got his hand in his pocket. Now for a guy, I don't know how it kind of works out for a girl, but for a guy, when, you, when, he, when his hand's in his pocket, it's usually a posture of feeling really, really relaxed. Safe. That no matter what comes... Principalities, powers, death, life, suffering, whatever comes in Christ Jesus, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul says, I am convinced, not so that he boasts in front of you, but so that you will be able to say those words from your lips, so that you'll be able to say, I too am convinced that nothing in all creation will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because God not only wants to save you, brothers and sisters, he wants you to know you are saved. So can I just say as I, as I wrap it up, just a couple of things. If, if, you don't know yet, know yet, if you don't yet know Jesus, oh my goodness, you are missing out on so much. Jesus wants to drown you in a sea of love. Come and yield towards this love. It will set you free. For, for those of us who know Jesus, never think you've gotten to the end of the the edge of the sea so to speak it is so big so vast take time to men meditate on this one sermon can't quite do it for you a sermon series can't quite do it for you be still and know that this god is for you father son and holy spirit and then and this this knowledge is too good to keep to ourselves let let this truth motivate a desire to let the world know a world that is lost in a loveless, random, cold universe where no one cares. They are desperate for this truth. Well, let's transition to a time of thank you. Thank you to our Father in heaven. There's a mic there. There's a mic there. And um, I'm going to lead us firstly in a brief prayer. Then I'm going to invite you, even as I'm praying, I invite you to just come up. And can I say, 
they don't have to be long prayers. In fact, we're preferring short prayers, short thank you prayers, so that more and more people can, be, can actually say thank you. And it's us coming to the throne of grace with confidence that we want to be those Christians that are saying, not so much it's not fair, but Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And whatever else God has placed on your heart, because be it big or small, God loves it when his people are thankful. It brings him glory and us joy. So let me pray. And as I'm praying, don't, don't be bashful. Come up and lead us in a time of thanksgiving and prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we really, just, we really want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to say thank you, Lord, that you are so for us. Father, you are for us that you didn't withhold your one and only son. Jesus, you are for us because you, you demonstrated your love. When we, when we were at our worst, you gave us your best, your very life. You, let, you gave up your life for certified enemies. That's love. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that as we've seen in Romans 8, that you have adopted us, you have sealed us, you have empowered us, and then when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, you get to turn our aches and groans into prayers dead on target with the Father's will, that you're interceding for us, just like Jesus interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. We want to say thank you, thank you, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.